Hi all, I'm Amelia. I work as a developer advocate focused on games and spatial computing. So I work with a lot of non-game technologies, and while a lot of them really don't make sense to apply to games for a lot of reasons related to how games work and how games are made, I always get really excited when I find one of those topics where game devs absolutely could and should be benefiting from the work others are doing elsewhere, which is why I'm so excited to talk to you today about build systems and hopefully get you just as excited as I am about this topic that you might think is a little stodgy and unexciting. But setting up a modern build system on the cloud really has the potential to pay dividends to your entire dev and design process, whether you already have some sort of build system in place or are just learning about all these concepts for the first time today. So I'm gonna start by talking about what I mean when I talk about build system and wrap that up in some industry terms you may or may not be familiar with. After talking about why this actually matters, we'll get into some nitty gritty details about what options you have for hosting build systems and how those interact with the specific challenges game developers face. Then the meat of the talk is gonna be a case study where we're gonna talk about using GitHub Actions to build a Unity game for iOS and Android. And then finally, I'll wrap up and talk about how, great, that's a fun little toy sample project. How does that shift when you're trying to use it for your production project and share some resources to dive deeper? Hopefully that sounds great. So what do I mean when I talk about build systems? If you already have a build system, maybe when you think of that, you think of the computer you have sitting in the corner of your office. Or maybe if you're a larger studio, maybe you maintain some servers and use Jenkins to control them. But I think sort of a big part of the way things are traditionally done is when you want to build, you tell the build system to build it. Whereas there's sort of a larger shift happening where you make it much more about being proactive builds. You are not maintaining physical hardware. You are not telling a build system, hey, I want to build now. They just happen automatically and they proactively notify you when you do something like break the build. So in enterprise software and web software and other types of software development, we talk a lot about continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Um, don't get too caught up in all the terminology, but I think the concepts are important to touch on to look at what can we be aiming for here. So the idea of continuous integration is assuming you have a single code repository with a main branch, you should be merging in code as often as possible, no longer with feature branches. And every time you merge code in, some automated tests should run. Um, in games, I think this is less likely to be proper unit tests or integration tests or anything like that. But I think just building your game to make sure it actually compiles can be really valuable. The same as maybe adding in some sort of light content checks around your game scripting or whatever sort of custom tooling you might have. The next step beyond that is continuous deployment or continuous delivery, where if you say, hey, we're already testing this code every time it comes into the main branch, so we know it mostly works, why don't we just deploy it straight to production once it passes those tests? Um, this makes a lot of sense and is really obvious when you are working with deploying server code or an HTML and JavaScript bundle for a web app. That's obviously trickier if, trickier if you are building a game client that needs to be sent off to a platform holder for submission. Um, you are not going to automatically deploy your console game or your mobile game every time you merge code in. But I think there are still two really valuable things here. One is you're still generating builds as frequently as possible, whether that's to send to a QA team or some sort of set of beta testers or whatever your flow looks like. And it also means that when you do go to do platform submission, have that as fully automated to the extent you can. So it's not that much of a big deal. Um, but why does all this matter? Why are we even talking about this? So we're all game developers, we're all game designers. We are used to the idea that in a game, you want this really tight feedback loop of the player does something, they see what effect it has on the world, and the next time they do it, they can tweak it slightly and get better at the game. That exact process holds true for us as developers trying to do what we do. The tighter we can get our feedback loops, the more effectively we can improve our processes and our craft. Um, so at a very basic level, making it faster for you to figure out if you've broken a build, can cause you to fix bugs more quickly and increase your development velocity. Engineers can catch bugs more quickly. Artists can integrate assets more quickly. That collaboration loop with QA and beta testers can get much tighter. But it's even more than that. If a build used to take a day and now takes an hour, or if it used to take an hour and now takes five minutes, how does that fundamentally change the way your engineering team works or your engineering team works with the design team or how that QA loop works? 
Um, a really common use case I see is automating the process of adding art assets to your engine. If that used to require the work of an engineer and now doesn't, how does that enable your visual artist to experiment and fundamentally change their workflow? This stuff is about improving your craft as a creative endeavor, not just optimizing the build system. So to get in the weeds a little bit, if you want some sort of CI setup, one of the first questions you'll run into is where you're going to host it. And so there's a whole spectrum of solutions here, starting with what we already talked about, where you might have your own server rack or your own single PC in the corner of your office or bedroom if you're really scrappy. This is a great solution. This can save you a lot of money, especially if you're a much larger studio operating at scale, but it is also a lot of work. On the far other side of things, we have fully cloud hosted solutions where conceptually you go to a cloud CI provider and you basically say, here's what my build process looks like. Here's when I want it to run. Anytime a build should happen, just automatically spin me up a virtual machine, run my tests and shut it down. You don't have to think about scaling. They will just bill you a couple cents per run or however it works out. It just works. In the middle, we have this nice middle option where you can still use all of the nice cloud tooling we're going to talk about, but instead of those cloud provided virtual machines, you're going to provision your own VMs from cloud providers that you would then manage. So you're still thinking about how many servers do I have? You're managing that scaling yourself, but you don't have to deal with physical hardware. Um, and this is what a lot of larger studios will end up with because you end up with the flexibility of maintaining your own servers, but the simplicity of not having to deal with physical bare metal. But all three of these are really great viable options. Um, specifically though, I'm here to talk to you about cloud hosted solutions and why I think they are really, really great for game studios of all sizes. Um, we're gonna talk in our case study about doing iOS builds where it's really nice to be able to build on Macs without having to maintain your own fleet of Mac minis. And we're gonna look at a lot of open source tooling that these cloud-based platforms rely on that give you much more friendly, developer-friendly setups than some other systems. Um, if you're on the larger side of things, it's nice to not have to manually manage capacity. If you have new projects spinning up and spinning down, it's really nice to give teams self-service options. And if you're a small studio, you don't have to think about it. It just works. Um, if your needs grow beyond that physical computer in the corner of your room, you don't have to worry about that. It'll scale with you. Um, but this is all generic CI stuff. None of this is really about games. What makes this hard for games? Well, for one thing, we are not just building Java apps or web apps or anything like that. We are compiling complex 3D simulations that need more powerful computers. Um, so your build machines need to be more powerful. A lot of the tooling we're looking at tends to optimize for Linux, but if you're building for a console, say, you need to be running on Windows. That can add some complexity. And finally, everything we're talking about tends to rely on command line tools to make it work, um, which is great if you're dealing with software ecosystems that rely heavily on command line tools. A lot of game engines don't really play nicely with that, so there can be some extra complexity to get your build set up. But we have solutions to these. I think cl Cloud CI in particular does a really great job of tackling these. So on the build requirement side, if you're maintaining your own hardware, you have to be thinking about when do we need to upgrade our machines? When are they getting too slow? Whereas at least in theory on the cloud, you just need to pay for a higher tier of VM and you have a better build machine. Um, similarly, any cloud CI platform, whether you're provisioning your own VMs or using a hosted solution, they're gonna maintain infrastructure for Windows and Linux and Mac OS. So you don't have to be doing IT management on three different operating systems potentially. Um, and as long as we're using platforms like GitHub Actions that have strong cultures of open source contributions, that sort of command line tooling issue can be hand waved over. We're gonna be looking at tooling for Unity where Unity by itself doesn't have great command line support that exists, but it's not ideal but we have community supported tooling to fill in the gaps so you don't have to do that work yourself. So let's dive into a case study. This is a project called Boat Attack that Unity provides to show off their universal render pipeline and some other new engine features. It is a full featured 3D boat racing game um, that is still very much a sample project, but it is relatively complicated. For example, it's large enough with its assets that it needs to use Git LFS for storage which makes it a pretty good use case to look at for adding a CI setup to. So we're going to be setting up a couple GitHub Actions workflows so that any time code is pushed to the main branch, it is going to automatically build it in Unity for Windows. It is going to upload an executable file that we can download and run on Windows. 
It is going to build for both iOS and Android, and then we will have an optional runnable workflow that will submit it to the iOS App Store or Apple Test Flight distribution or the Google Play Store for beta or production distribution. So this is a really great case study for a couple of reasons. One is looking at a Unity project with GitHub Actions is a really great pairing. There is really strong community support for Unity within GitHub Actions. Um, tackling iOS and Android code signing is a real pain point I see with a lot of game developers. And so this is gonna be a great way to show how you can just bypass a lot of that frustration and time using these tools. Dealing with iOS and Android as opposed to say console SDKs, there's no NDA here. I can show you the full code to everything I'm doing on GitHub. You can download it yourself and you can run it. Um, as I mentioned on the Apple side of things, what's great is we can prevent you from needing to have to deal with having your own physical Mac hardware. We'll get a show off here how you can build for iOS entirely on the cloud. And we're not really gonna touch on it in this example, but if you are doing more automated testing, Testing on Android can be a particular pain point because there's such a large device matrix. So this sort of setup can make it easier to test on a larger number of devices, which is really helpful. So I've mentioned GitHub Actions a lot. What actually is GitHub Actions? Uh, GitHub Actions is a CI and CD system that's built into GitHub. Um, if you have a Git repo that is on GitHub and you have GitHub Actions enabled, you basically add a YAML file into your project, which is just a text config file that specifies, here is what my build looks like. Um, and crucially, these workflows are composable. You can just write a series of bash commands or command line scripts that you run, but you can also include community written actions provided by GitHub or by community members in that workflow. We're gonna use that a lot in the next few minutes. Um, it has built-in support for running, running VMs that are Windows or Linux or Mac OS. By default, it uses hosted runners, meaning you just say, I want to run this, and it will spin up a VM for you. But there are options if you want to self-host and manage that yourself. Um, it is also completely free for open source. Even if I was not a Microsoft employee, this open source example that I'm dealing with would be completely free to run. Um, and it also works in GitHub Enterprise if you're not running on github.com. Um, so I will show you the URL to the actual repository later. You can check that out. I'm going to be hand waving over some of the code just because a lot of it is complex and not particularly worth showing off in this time constraint. Um, but for the most part, this is really straightforward. So this is an example of what one of those YAML files looks like, where we are starting by saying, we want this Windows build to happen every time code is pushed to the main branch. So we start out by literally saying, here is a workflow that we're going to call Windows build. It is going to execute when the main branch is pushed to. Um, those environment variables are for dealing with Unity licensing, which we'll touch on that in a little bit. And then we establish a job that we're going to run on Ubuntu, which might be slightly counterintuitive. If we're building for Windows, why are we spinning up a Linux virtual machine? Um, GitHub Actions does charge by the minute, and they charge slightly different rates based on what sort of runners you're using. So Linux is the cheapest, Windows is slightly more expensive, Mac is a fair bit more expensive. Um, since Unity has the ability to make Windows builds from Linux, as long as you're not using anything in it that requires Windows, which might happen if you're using third-party SDKs, for example. But by default, we can probably build this project on Linux and save a little bit. So we're going to do that. And from there, we get into actually establishing the steps of our workflow. So what is going to happen? And really, we only need to do three things here. We need to check out the repository, which we could just write a single command line script that does a git clone, but GitHub provides this checkout action that will automatically do that for us. We're going to use git LFS here. Um, here is where I'm hand waving over a bunch of things around how we're caching our LFS assets. But again, you can check out the full repo for details. Um, after we have a VM whose working directory has our git repo, we just want to build it. Um, and so here we are using a community provided action. There's an organization called GameCI that maintains a whole bunch of things, such as Docker images for every supported version of Unity. They have a whole bunch of pre-made GitHub actions that we're going to be using here that can do things like build your project and manage your licenses. Um, and they also have things like support for alternate CI platforms and some tooling if you are using self-hosted runners and need to auto-scale those. So this second step here is just going to tell our GitHub Actions workflow, hey, there's a Unity project in our working directory. We should build that for the target platform of Windows. And the output of that is going to be an executable file sitting in a build folder as if we had just built it in Unity ourselves. 
And then that final step is just going to upload that artifact, meaning we have this executable sitting on this virtual machine that is not going to exist in a few minutes. We need to get that somewhere usable. So this upload artifact action that GitHub provides will upload it to our Git repo, not mm, to our GitHub project. It will not be inside the Git repo, but when we go to your GitHub page and you click the actions button, it will show up there as an associated object with the build. So you can just click download and get that executable file. Um, so that's really straightforward. That will pretty much just work. You push new code, you will end up with an error if your build fails, and if your build succeeds, there'll be an executable file you can download and run or send to your QA team or whatever you want. Say we wanted to do that for iOS. The process is mostly the same. There are just a couple complications because iOS is a little more complicated. Um, the first step we will have to deal with is code signing. Um, once we've handled that, we're going to have to deal with using multiple VMs. So if you have ever built a Unity project for iOS before, building in Unity generates you an Xcode project that you then have to open an Xcode and build to get a finished copy of your iOS app. We could do all of that on a single Mac virtual machine, but as we established, Linux machines are a lot cheaper and game CI support for Mac is still very much in beta. So it's going to be much more effective for us to do the Unity build in Linux send that build over to a Mac virtual machine and then use that for the actual Xcode build, which is not as complicated as it sounds. And then finally, we'll have to deal with what does actual platform submission look like if we want to upload this to Apple or to Google. So if you've ever dealt with iOS code signing before, it can be a hassle. Uh, to begin with, you need to generate certificates, which is a process that involves doing a bunch of stuff on your Mac and interacting with Apple websites. And the end result is a certificate file that if you have multiple developers, you have to share that certificate file somewhere because anyone who wants to build it needs that file on their computer. We're going to be using a tool called Fastlane, which is an open source project that aims to provide all sorts of build tools for iOS and Android developers. So it is going to handle building the iOS project for us, but it's also going to manage this code signing step. Um, I have some GitHub action scripts that I've written that I'm not going to show here that will basically manage the whole initial code signing certificate generation process for you, where if you get some API keys from Apple and make sure your app has an app ID in the App Store connects, and you create a Git repository for your certificates. And we get to use a tool called Fastlane Match that specifically generates those certificates for you and stores them encrypted in that Git repo. So any of your developers who have access to that Git repo and the encryption keys can just automatically fetch those certificates on demand using the Fastlane Match tool. Um, so we have some one-time scripts that you can check out. The sort of names are linked there that handle that process of generating certificates and storing them in Git. Um, and then basically everything else is going to happen automatically as part of our fast lane build that we'll touch on in a second. From then, we just need two different build steps, one happening on Linux to build in Unity, and then one happening on macOS to build in Xcode. Um, here I'm showing off a cool feature of GitHub Actions, which is sort of variable matrices or matrices, um, where you can see we have this target platform variable that has two values. It can be either iOS or Android. And when we run that Unity Builder step, we are saying the target platform's value should be that matrix value, which means when GitHub Actions gets here, it's going to see this. It's going to spin up two different VMs, and it is going to run one of these builds with target platform of iOS and one of them with target platform is Android. So this is a really effective way to build our project twice despite only writing one script. Um, I'm not showing it here, but after this, we would do the same upload artifact step we did last time, and it would end up uploading either an Android Studio project for Android or an Xcode project for iOS to the sort of artifacts associated with this build so that then another virtual machine can pull those down, which is exactly what we'll do next. So this workflow, you will notice that needs Unity step. Um, in the last step, we named that previous build Unity. So this workflow is going to run automatically whenever that previous step completes. And it's going to be pretty straightforward. It's going to check out the repository again, which might not even really be necessary. Um, it is going to download that Xcode project that we uploaded in the previous build. And then it is going to run a command line script that will build the iOS app. Um, so I'm hand waving over a lot here, but basically Fastlane build is going to execute a Fastlane command. We're going to look a little bit at the sort of Fastlane Ruby configuration file that defines that in a second. Um, if you're not used to Ruby, bundle exec basically is just a command that makes sure that we're executing things with a properly set up Ruby environment with all the dependencies we need. 
Um, and that Fastlane build, if everything is set up properly, is going to produce a code signed IPA that you can then do whatever you want with. You can manually drag that to an iOS device. You can submit it to a beta testing service, whatever you want. Such as, for example, <laughs> uploading to Test Flight or the App Store. Um, the important thing here, though, is I like having that iOS build step running every time you merge code into the main branch. That's a really great way to make sure that your iOS builds still work. Um, but if you try to upload to test flight every single time you merge code into the main branch, Apple is going to rate limit you and you're not going to be able to upload any builds for the rest of the day. So that's really not good. Um, so I tend to set up uh, distribution workflows to be manual. So you can set things up. So if you go to the GitHub Actions tab, you can see these different actions for I want to run the workflow to submit to test flight or the App Store, and you run them manually. Um, and you can see here a little bit of what Fastlane's configuration looks like. They also have the sort of composable system where you can say, I want the test flight beta action to both run a build and then run the upload to test flight action, which will take the generated IPA and upload it straight to Apple. So we sort of have a build system within our build system, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, you can check out the full details of the fast file in the repo that I'll show a link to in a second. But conceptually, that's what's happening here. The GitHub Actions workflow is just sort of delegating to Fastlane and saying, hey, you know how to build this iOS app and upload it or do whatever you want to do. Make that happen. Um, Android is going to be basically the same as iOS, just a little bit simpler. Um, code signing is easier. You get a JSON file at the end of your process that you can store however you want. Um, we're still doing that same workflow of using Unity to generate uh, Gradle projects and Fastlane to build it, but Gradle and Android Studio can run on Linux, so we can use a single machine instead of needing to do that Linux and Mac OS hop. Um, and I also just want to caveat here and talk about Unity licensing. GameCI has built-in workflows for using both a personal and a pro license. Um, the workflow is going to be a little different between the two of them, but not much. The main caveat here is officially Unity seats by default are usable by a single person. So if you are a solo dev or a developer on a team setting up your own personal CI workflow, you can probably use your existing seat. But if you're trying to set up a shared build system, you may want to talk to your Unity rep. They have solutions for CI seats that you can deal with. Um, so talk to your Unity rep. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Um, again, you can check out the example repo here. It has everything I talked about in full detail. You can fork it. There are clear setup instructions. You can get this all integrated with your own Unity project on GitHub today. But how does that? How does this actually scale up to your project, though? That is a sample project, a large one, but still a sample project. Um, where is this going to fall over? I think a real common pain point I see is the size of your assets versus the disk size of GitHub Actions hosted runners and your cache size limits. Um, there are a bunch of solutions there. One of the more common ones is eventually migrating to self-hosted runners. So you can still use the same GitHub Actions workflows and YAML syntax we've been talking about. You will just maintain your own VM infrastructure. Um, figuring out how to optimize runner costs is its own very complex discussion. We've already talked a little bit about optimizing things, such as doing any build on Linux that you can before escalating to Windows or Mac but there's a lot else you can do. Um, and also, again, things that complicated if you specifically need to do Unity builds on Windows or Mac OS. Um, GitHub Actions supports Windows and Mac OS. GameCI has support for these platforms. They are just a little less mature than the Linux ones, um, which also, if that ends up being a problem for you, you can help contribute. GameCI is a community-run open source project that would love your help. So how do you get started if you want to? GameCI has really great docs. GitHub Actions also has great docs. Fastlane's documentation is really good, but it definitely assumes you're an experienced iOS or Android developer. So if that's not your background, it may be a bit much. Um, but my sample project, which I have been linking you to again and again, has a fully functioning Fastlane setup. So that can also be a great way to get started with that mobile specific setup if that's new to you. Um, this is all great resources if you are a Unity developer building for GitHub Actions, though. What else do you do if that's not you? Um, GitHub Actions has great support for non-Unity engines. If you're using Unreal, there are also community projects to add support for that. If you're using any alternative engine, as long as you can build it from a command line, you can integrate it into GitHub Actions pretty easily. If you're not using Git, there are also options. Azure DevOps, as an example, has great performance support. Um, 
But even then, assuming you have the sort of basic build setup working, whatever platform you're using, whatever game engine you're using, what comes after that? Um, for one thing, adding more tests can be really effective. That is its whole other talk about how to test games, when should you or should you not test games. But having the sort of basic platform of a modern CI-based build system can give you the comfort to do that. Um, similarly, we talked a little bit about submitting to platform holders, but there's a lot more work you can think through about how to fully take advantage of it with your platform submission workflow and what you can optimize and what you can automate. But even more than that, just think creatively. Once you have this platform, what can you enable? Um, a really great example that I see pretty often is game developers who are working on games that don't plan to target the web, but they can ship builds for WebGL anyway. Like if they just change their Unity platform, target to WebGL, the build will work. Um, you can set up your project pretty quickly so that anytime anyone opens a pull request, that triggers a WebGL build that gets inserted into the pull request. So your code review process can involve having a live embedded playable copy of your game right there in the code review. That is really cool. And that is just one example of the sorts of things you can do when what you have is a way to build your game automatically on the cloud and build whatever you want on top of that. Um, so really, the sky is the limit, and I would urge you to think through what is going to help you and your team do things more effectively and more creatively and differently. Um, and that's really all I've got. Thanks so much. Uh, take care and goodbye. <laughs>